All right. So um, I guess um, I already started uh, on YouTube. I just want to say whoever is on YouTube, if you could just comment and say if you can hear me clearly. Um, just let me know if you can hear me clearly. Um, you can comment on YouTube. Um, that way I'll uh, have an idea of what's going on. Okay, perfect. So um, let's uh, just give it a couple of minutes because I want to share this one very quick to all those people who wanted um, to attend this session and then we can start in two minutes. So um, again, those of you who just joined, just give me two minutes. I'm sharing it on uh, on Facebook, and then we can start with um, my screen and everything. Just give me one moment. Uh, all right, so uh, let me share my screen. So um, I guess that everybody should be able to see the screen now. Uh, as you know, my name is Faizan Ali, and I'm an assistant professor at College of Hospitality and Tourism Leadership at the University of South Florida. And at the same time, I am also a research coordinator for M3 Center, uh, which is located uh, in uh, U USF, University of South Florida. I work with uh, or under supervision of Dr. Jehan Jogunoglu. And M3 Center basically um, is a, a research center where we conduct different type of research related to innovation and technology and hospitality and tourism leadership. Uh, okay, so today's webinar actually will be very um, quick one. It's about PLS SEM. And then uh, because it's an emerging field, it's a uh, a progressing field, obviously the reporting of findings and the standards uh, keep changing. So today's webinar will be talking about how do you re report your results from uh, PLS and what are the current standards uh, for different type of values or different type of things. Now, um, during this session, if you have any questions, 
uh, please uh, ask them in the chat and we will have uh, Dr. Sidan uh, who will uh, help me with those questions and I can then answer your questions that are available on um, on YouTube. The reason why I didn't do Zoom uh, uh, is because of uh, two issues. One is obviously it's limited in terms of participation. Second, it's difficult for us to track the questions on multiple platforms. So if you are watching on YouTube, and I guess everybody is watching on YouTube, please make sure that you put your questions in the chat and then I'll try to answer as many questions as possible. Uh, all right, so uh, let's go into the presentation. It will be short one. I'm going to present a few slides and then I'll do um, a hands on uh, analysis using smart PLS so that you see how do we analyze the data and how do we do the uh, how do we report the findings from that uh, data analysis. Uh, um, once again, thank you all for joining. Uh, whoever is joining from whichever part of the world. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, depending on the time zone you are in. All right, so the first question um, is, what is PLS and why do we, we use PLS, right? So um, just remember that PLS is an analytical tool um, and it helps us understand um, relationships between different uh, constructs in a model. So if you have uh, a model with different variables and these variables are impacting each other in different ways, uh, we use PLS SEM to analyze the interrelationships between those constructs. So what it basically does is um, it uh, takes principal component analysis, which is one type of factor analysis uh, and regression analysis, puts it together into one package and then uh, gives you the results. So if you think about principal component analysis, what it does is it simply tells you uh, are the questions that you use to measure different variables. So in a model, you have different variables and then you measure each variable with different type of constructs. So principal component analysis simply tells you whether these questions that you use to measure different variables, are these valid and reliable or not? So that's one. If all those questions are valid and reliable, then the next step is whether the relationships between those constructs are uh, positive, negative, um, or significant or not significant. So that comes from regression-based path analysis. So this is the simple logic behind it. Towers, uh, um, I mean, it takes both these uh, two analytical tools, put them together into one package. Now, um, many people are confused with why are you using PLS? So there are two groups of people. One is people who love PLS, and then one is people who hate PLS. Um, people who love PLS, they tend to use PLS for pretty much everything. People who hate PLS tend not to use PLS for everything, which actually is not a good approach. Um, uh, normally, when I talk to uh, you know students or people or reviewers or authors or editors, um, there's a common question, and the question is, why are you using PLS? So what's the point for using PLS, right? So what's important uh, for all of us to understand is that PLS is an analytical tool, okay? Uh, it has obviously some... Um, benefits, but it also has some limitations and shortcomings. And as researchers, it's important for all of us to understand what are the benefits, what are the limitations. Um, it's pretty much like, um, uh, you know, I'll give you an example. So if I ask anybody, um, is Hammer a good tool or a bad tool? I mean, it's very difficult to answer because it depends on what do you want to do with the hammer. If you pick up a hammer and if you want to um, put a nail into a wall, uh, obviously, hammer can become a very good tool because that's what you need it for. But if you pick up the same hammer and if you go and try to break a very expensive TV in your home or your computer screen or your laptop, then of course it's not a very good tool. Why would you do that? So um, all the analytical tools are pretty much like that. So you have to think about it. Why are you using it? and if it's the right tool to use in that situation. So that's very important for all of us to understand. This is why it's important not to have extraordinarily favor towards a, sim, uh, uh, to, towards a specific analytical tool or an extraordinary animosity towards a specific analytical tool. So you, know, you should understand why are you using it um, and if it's really applicable in that situation. Now, some of the reasons why people have used PLS over the years is because 
uh, of its ability to handle complicated models. If your model is very complicated with a lot of items, with a lot of um, relationships, PLS tend to be a very good tool to use in that type of situation. Um, then obviously, um, if your model has multiple types of variables, so there are variables that are reflective in nature, there are uh, variables that are formative in nature in terms of measurement. So if your um, models are like, if your model include formative uh, variables uh, or formative constructs, then it's very um, uh, easy to use PLS with that type of models. Then um, another thing with PLS is its ability to deal with, uh, with uh, studies that have uh, relatively smaller sample sizes. Now, here one thing very important is to understand that um, yeah, it doesn't stop you um, with usage of larger sample sizes. So there is a misconception that if you have a large sample size, then you shouldn't use PLS, like because PLS is only good with smaller sample sizes. That's not the case. What we mean by saying this is that PLS can handle large sample sizes very well, which you know CBSEM also does that. However, if you are in a situation where you have a smaller sample size, like some, um, you know, there are some academic disciplines where by nature you get smaller sample sizes. For instance, uh, organizational behavior. If you are conducting research in human resource management, normally you don't have um, uh, an ease of data collection. So normally the sample sizes are smaller. So in that type of situation, PLS produces better results compared to some other approaches in um, structural equation modeling. And then another uh, good benefit with PLS is that it also helps you uh, calculate latent variable scores. Now, what do we mean by latent variable scores? So sometimes what happens is you, um, and most of the times with these researches that we do, um, if you have seen questionnaires, normally the way we develop questionnaires is very interesting. So um, let me um, stop sharing for a moment and share my um, screen. That way everybody will be um, able to see what exactly I'm trying to do. So, all right, so let me share my screen. So if you look at my screen right now at this moment, you will see there's a model and this model have these different variables called um, uh, employee performance, uh, rewards, commitment, turnover, and things like this. Now, most of us that do research, our models pretty much look the same. Obviously, the variables are different, but that's how you look at a model. You have variables, then you have some questions to measure those variables, and you look at the relationship between the variables. So in this type of situation, if you look at um, commitment, for example, this one, commitment is a variable. Uh, it's measured using three questions. So X12, X13, X14 are three questions that you use to measure commitment. Now, in the questionnaire, we normally do not measure commitment directly. So commitment is like a heading in the questionnaire, but under commitment, you have three questions that are used to measure commitment, right? So in this type of situation, X12, X13, and X14, these three variables right here, these are your uh, observed variables because you are directly getting data for them from your respondents. But commitment here is a latent variable because you are not directly measuring it. This one is coming through X12, X13, and X14. Now, if you are using SPSS or any that type of tool, there's no way for you to measure commitment. All people do is they take an average of X12, X13, and X14 in order to get um, the score for commitment, which is not the right way of doing it. So. When you are using PLSSEM, what it does is it also helps calculate the score for these latent variables. And this score can be later on used for subsequent analysis or some um, you know, additional analysis for your model. So that's another benefit of using uh, PLS. So moving back to the presentation. Um, so these are some of the reasons why we use PLS. Um, uh, Sidan, are there any uh, questions? Uh, yes, uh, well, there are there, uh, there are some questions. There are no questions at this moment. No, no, there are some questions. Uh, would you like to hear one or two of them? Yes, yes, please. Let's let's do a couple of questions now so that you know we answer questions along the way. Okay. 
Okay, one question from Asim Aziz. What is the easiest way for beginners to interpret results of some PLS? Okay, so this is a good question. I was going to say this, but look, it's not only for early career researchers. It's also for people who are well established in the field. I mean, look, you have to be a lifelong learner. It's not that you learn something now and then you are secure and you have a guarantee for the rest of your life. We all, I mean, I uh, normally talk with people who I think know more than me. In fact, this morning I talked to a very good friend of mine, uh, Dr. Ch Jackie Chia uh, from Malaysia. He's a very smart guy, an upcoming uh, scholar in PLS. And just ask him some questions that I was not sure about. Um, I talked to uh, Professor Christian Ringler, uh, Professor Mustafa Rasuli Manish, uh, you know, so all these people who are emerging. So it's not that you guarantee something by just learning it once. You have to make sure that you are following the progression in the field. Uh, and for that, the best way of doing it is make sure you follow some of the top scholars in the field, right? So things change and you will see in my presentation, I'll show you how over the last couple of years, things have changed. Like obviously uh, with new research, with new uh, evidence, the reporting standards change. Uh, for example, uh, you know, for the last five, 10 years, people have been using goodness of fit measure in PLS called GOF. Um, and even now I see some people are using it. However, it's st strongly recommended not to use it because it's against the philosophy of this method. So that's how you have to be in a touch and in line with whatever is happening. The best way of doing it, I said you should follow the main scholars, but then also I'll, I'll show you a very good resource here. And that resource is um, a Smart PLS's website. So if you go on the website for Smart PLS, here is a section called resources. So if you go to these resources, you will see that there are links to a lot of literature, right? So you will see that um, not only you get some, um, you know, basic stuff, like when you are getting started, like RSMRs for new researchers, there are some stuff, but then also some recent developments like cross-validated predictive ability test. This is a very new paper. I mean, even if I open it, you will see that it just got out this paper, um, this one, uh, 2020. So it just got out in April, 2020, which means that the website is very up to date. So that's a very good way of keeping yourself up to date with whatever is happening. But um, go to conferences, talk to people, send out emails to people, you know, meet them. Um, but keep yourself up to date. Again, I would uh, mention this, that it's not only for new researchers, it's also for everybody else, like people who have been using for PLS for a long time. So uh, just make sure that you um, keep yourself up to date with whatever is happening in the field. Um, all right. Um, Sedan, any other question? Yes, there is. There, actually, there are several questions. Uh, the two questions are related to the sample size. Uh, Asim Aziz uh, is asking again, can we use PLS SEM for larger sample size, like sample size of 454? Yeah. And Alfred Abu Adu Bobby is asking, can it be used for big data analytics? Uh, yes, so um, now again for Asim's question, I already mentioned that you can use it for big sample size. There's no problem with that. Um, uh, for big data analysis, again, it depends on what do you want to do in big data analysis. So normally, my understanding is that normally big data analysis is a qualitative analysis in which you are getting big chunks of unstructured data. So that one you have to be very sure because when we say big data, it covers a lot of stuff. Like let's say if you go to tripadvisor.com and you download a million tweets, uh, a million reviews, or you go to Twitter and you download like 1.5 million tweets, and that's qualitative data. You cannot use PLS for that. However, uh, you can go to TripAdvisor and you can collect data about star ratings and the amount of nights stayed or the score for cleanliness or stuff like this, which is quantitative data. If you translate it into a model, which is regression-based model, why not? Uh, you can use PLS for that. Remember that these tools are statistical tools. These tools uh, are not magic. So when you use these tools, it doesn't matter if it's PLS. It can be as simple as a chi-square test or a t-test or something like that. 
all these tools need to have a theory behind this. So you have to develop a model. If your model is regression-based model, like if you're looking at uh, cause and effect or how one variable impacts another variable, then by all means you can use PMS or CM. All right, so let's move further to the next slide. Uh, <clears throat> remember that, uh, like I said, when you are using PLS, it's also important that you understand uh, what is happening in that field, right? What's the discussion about? Uh, why people criticize PLS SEM? I don't know. Maybe I should ask this question and then people can answer it in the comments um, or on YouTube. Has anybody ever got a criticism for, from any reviewer or an editor for using PLS? Or have you ever got like a major revision or a rejection because you use PLS? I've certainly got it. I actually have uh, spent a lot of time, um, you know, justifying my usage of PLS SEM. So I don't know, maybe if anybody got it, please share your experience in the comments. We will look at it and then try to answer that. Uh, remember this, PLS is um, um, considered pretty much like a stepchild. So it has really received its fair share of criticism. People have criticized it a lot. Um, uh, some of the references, and, and again, I think it, it's very important for you to understand what that criticism is. It helps you justifying your work in the future. Some of the main references I've provided here, this Ronco and Everman uh, was one of the very, uh, uh, you know, it, it's a premier paper in, in terms of uh, criticizing PLS. It's a very good paper. They've criticized it on multiple points. Um, and some of the main criticism on PLS is um, uh, that it doesn't, it's not a latent variable method. Yeah, or some people said it lacks goodness of fit measures. Uh, some people said produces biased parameter estimates, like the, the estimates or the, the values that it produces are biased, they are not accurate. So those type of things. Um, again, this uh, maybe this is right, maybe it's wrong. We don't know because it's science, right? It develops, it goes with the time. However, what's interesting is that after this criticism, the criticism they are also counter articles that were written by uh, Professor Edward Rigdon <clears throat> uh, or um, uh, Marco. Marco wrote a couple of very good papers. Uh, so those papers, I've also uh, you know, provided the references here. Please check them out. Um, but, but if you look at these counter papers, what these counter papers have done is they have not take, uh, taken a criti critical look at those criticism papers. What they, these papers have done is they have uh, run simulations or they have come up with evidence to counter those criticisms. And very interesting papers that says that, uh, you know, uh, some of these people who are criticizing PLS have actually ignored PLS's philosophy of measurement and it's also its analytical goals. Because remember, PLS is a method that you use for certain things. You cannot use it for everything, right? Um, and then also one other thing is that many people um, who have criticized PLS have actually criticized it by comparing it to CBSEM, which again is not a very very good approach because these are two different methods and their assumptions are different, their um, methodological considerations are different, um, you know, their estimation um, or their measurement uh, approaches are different. So they shouldn't be compared um, because it's like you're comparing oranges with apples. It doesn't make sense, right? Um, so it's better that you take these two methods as complementary to each other instead of uh, competing methods to each other because both of them have some benefits as well as some limitations. Um, and then while we are talking about the criticism on PLS SEM, it's also important to understand that the underlying assumption for both these methods is uh, the stretch, the, the way you think of a variable. So CBSCM is actually based on common factor modeling, which says that uh, if you have multiple items, these items have a common factor um, that shares uh, some variance. Now, again, I want to keep it very simple because I know that there are some uh, fresh people or there are some people who have never used PLS or very young researchers. Um, so that's why I'll keep it a little simpler. Um, however, um, I would say that if you want to know more about this common factor versus composite factor, the discussion about it, I would highly recommend you to read this uh, guest editorial 
um, that I uh, have written with my very good friend and a brother to me, Professor Mustafa Rasuli Manish. Um, and this one is uh, published in Journal of Hospitality and Tourism uh, Leadership. And I think it's very easy to find it. It's not difficult at all. You can actually um, go to Journal of Hospitality and Tourism Technology. Uh, and um, here's this guest editorial. It's freely available, so you don't have to have a subscription for it. Um, if you just go and write a Journal of Hospitality and Tourism Technology guest editorial, it should come up. So in this one, we have discussed this uh, uh, common factor model versus composite factor model in detail. Uh, but the, the explanation is very simple. So it's very simple explanation it would help you understand um, you know the underlying assumptions for both PLSSEM as well as CBSCM so I'd recommend you uh, highly recommend you to uh, you know read that guest editorial it's it's a good one all right um, then um, there was a paper that recently got published a very very good paper I, I mean uh, it, one of the simplest papers that I have read, extremely easy to understand, um, and it's called it's this partial least squares uh, equation modeling in HRM research. Again, I'm going to show you um, this paper. It's this one. Um, so it's written by Professor Christian Ringler, uh, Marco Saster, um, and a couple of other people. Uh, one of, like I said, one of the best papers that I have read, you know, in my recent memory one of the simplest papers i would say to understand so i would highly recommend you looking at this paper again because it's going to help you understand a lot of um, you know things that we talk about for pls scm so according to this paper when you are running pls scm <clears throat> what you need to do is you need to uh, convert it into four steps so number one is you need to understand what's your research goal that's extremely important because that's going to determine whether you should use pls or not use PLS, so that's very important. Then once you are done with research, the determination of research goal, then you move on to structural model uh, specification, which I'll explain what that is. Uh, moving on to measurement model specification and then model estimation and results evaluation. So th these are the four steps that you need to do whenever you are uh, you know, uh, running a PLS SEM uh, model. Okay, so let's move on to uh, step number one, which is determination of research goals. So <clears throat> here you need to be very um, careful. Uh, think about your research. What, what is your research aim? What is your goal? Uh, are you developing a theory? Are you confirming a theory? So what, what is basically your goal? Because if your goal is to confirm a theory, then PLS-SEM is not a very good approach for you because PLS-SEM, um, is more of an exploratory research. Now, remember, many people confuse exploratory nature of PLS with qualitative analysis. So when I say it's more of an exploratory method, it doesn't mean that it's a qualitative method. It simply means that if your goal is to develop a theory, develop a theory by exploring multiple models. So how do we develop a theory? You um, Theory is basically explanation of a phenomena. You cannot explain a phenomena unless you explore it uh, robustly. So you can have multiple models. You look at which variable impacts which variable. What is the predictive accuracy? How well are these variables predicting another variable? That's exploration. So if you are exploring multiple mo models in order to come up with a theory, then PLS is a very good approach because it's a prediction-based approach or it's an exploratory approach in nature. However, if you are confirming a theory, which means if you already have a strong theory, if you are confirming it into a new context or something like that, then PLS is not a very good approach. However, again, like I said earlier, if you keep yourself up to date um, with certain developments in the field, you would see that um, things are changing. So now uh, we have another algorithm in a smart PLS that is called PLS consistent. What PLS consistent does is it brings the best of the two worlds. So let's say if you have a model where you are confirming a theory, but then um, all your variables are reflective, or let's say if your data is not normal, uh, normally distributed, or if your sample size is relatively small, those type of things where you you have situations for both CBSEM and PLSSEM, then you should use PLS 
consistent. However, that's for another day. Um, I already talked to professor, uh, my, my good friend, uh, Professor Jackie Chia. Uh, we will soon do another webinar on how do you run PLS consistent, what are the standards and stuff like that. But um, that would be probably a couple of weeks later. So step number one is determine your research goal. What is your research goal? Now, if your research goal is <clears throat> to explore different models in order to develop a theory, then you should go ahead with PLS. So that's number one. Once you know what your research goal, then you need to go to structural model specifications. Now, remember, development of your research and analysis of your research are two different things. Now, when you are doing analysis, some of you may have used PLS. You know that you go with measurement model first. So first you analyze measurement model. However, when you are developing your research, at that time you go with structural model first because you need to know which variables are in your model and how these variables are related to each other. So um, that's what structural model is. Or to make it simple, um, it actually in structural model, you establish links between different variables. Uh, which are known as hypothesis, right? So if you look at this one, you will see that service quality impacts customer satisfaction, customer satisfaction impacts customer loyalty. And then you have rewards um, or bonuses or incentives or stuff like that, um, that comes into the picture as well. So um, this is, I just made it, you know, randomly there's, I don't know much theory about it, but you know, just randomly made a, a diagram just to explain things. So when you are doing structural model specification there are a few things you need to talk about and one is what are the direct relationships so if you see service quality is directly impacting customer satisfaction customer satisfaction directly impacts customer loyalty service quality also impacts customer loyalty so those are your direct relationships um, then you also have indirect relationships and that is uh, service quality may be uh, may be impacting customer loyalty through customer satisfaction so um, that's a mediation, um, you know, so sometimes if you have a mediator in your model, you need to specify it in your structural model um, by uh, developing a hypothesis for it. So remember anything that is in the middle of two variables is not a mediator. You have to hypothesize it as a mediator between two variables. So that's um, your indirect relation. And then we also have some interaction uh, effects in a model, which simply means that Yes, uh, service quality impacts customer satisfaction. Uh, let's say if you go to a restaurant, the service quality is very good. Obviously, you are satisfied with that uh, restaurant. But if in that restaurant they give you a free ice cream, you know, which is a reward or a bonus or something, then service quality multiplied by those rewards would enhance your satisfaction, which is basically a moderation. So. Uh, if you have a moderator in your variable, again, you have to specify it in the structural model. So you have to develop a specific hypothesis for your moderation. So that's your structural model specification. The next one is where you go to measurement model specification. And um, once you know what are your hypotheses, then you also need to talk about how are you going to measure your variables. Here, uh, again, there are multiple considerations. One is whether your variable should be reflective or formative. Uh, so that's very important to know. Um, in this case, if you look at service quality, there's a theory called uh, uh, functional and technical quality of uh, functional and technical service quality. Uh, and then this theory says that service quality have got two dimensions. Both of them create service quality. So this very, uh, this line here, and this line here, these are not hypotheses. These are rather, how do you measure service quality? So service quality here is measured by functional quality and technical quality, and these, these are both formative, which means if you remove either of them, you cannot measure service quality. And then the other one is reflective, which is FQ1 and FQ2 are two questions that are used to measure functional quality, and these are reflective. Again, I don't want to go too much detail into reflective and formative now because it's a separate topic and we can do it another time. Uh, but uh, you need, with measurement model specifications, your, uh, your focus should be whether your constructs are reflective or formative. Then the second thing you need to think about is whether you have single item constructs or multi item constructs. Both of them can be used in PLS. However, remember that when you use a single item construct, the predictability of your model or the predictive um, relevance of your model decreases. 
So it's not recommended to use single item constructs. I mean, you can certainly use it. However, it's not a good, um, it's not a well recommended approach to use a single item construct. And then the third one that you need to think about in measurement model specification is whether you are using higher order models or uh, not. Higher model, uh, higher order model simply means are you directly measuring a variable through questions or are you dissecting it into several dimensions and then measure those dimensions um, separately? So in this case, service quality is a second order model, which means I do not have questions directly for service quality. Rather, I measure service quality through functional quality and technical quality. And then functional quality uh, has two questions. Technical quality has two questions. And then here in service quality, if you see, you will see that FQ1, FQ2, TQ1, TQ2, all these questions also load on this one which means that this is a higher order model. So these are the things that you need to um, be careful about when it comes to specifying your measurement model. Then um, we go with the, how, what are the stages or what are the steps of reporting, right? So how do you report things? Uh, again, uh, the first thing you need to um, do is this. And again, it's a very good paper by um, Marco. Um, it's published in 2014. Pretty much everybody uses the same structure and same flow till now. So the first question you need to ask is, is your model having reflectively measured concepts? Do your model have reflective concepts or not? If yes, then you go to these steps, which is indicator reliability, indicator consistency, reliability, convergent validity. And remember that this is stage one and stage one means measurement models um, analysis. So. Uh, or uh, we call it outer model specification or measurement model specification. So if you have reflective, uh, reflective constructs, this is what you need to do. And I'll explain how you do this one. If you don't have reflective, then you go with formative. You know, so uh, formative constructs have a different way of evaluation. You will see that it doesn't have reliability. It doesn't have different type of validities. Rather, it looks at conversion validity, collinearity, and significance and relevance of indicator weights. Once this is done, then you go to step two, which is your uh, structural model evaluation, which in, involves collinearity, um, blah, blah, blah. So all these things, I'll quickly explain what those are and how do you get those results. So again, Sidan, is there any other questions so far? There are questions related to <clears throat> reporting the results. Should I ask them now or should I wait for your presentation? Okay. Yeah, so if there are about reportings like standards or cutoff values or things like this, then I'm gonna do this very soon. Uh, but other than that. Actually, the okay. are Let's um, to move to uh, the next slide. Sorry, Sedan, I couldn't hear you. The questions are related to the reporting. Okay, okay. So th then we don't need to, um, you know, answer those directly now because I'm gonna do this one on this slide. Okay. okay. And um, all right. Okay. So um, now, when it comes to uh, reflective model assessment. Uh, there are a few things that you need to do. One is obviously uh, indicator reliability. You get this with item loadings and loading should be higher than 0 0.708. Uh, and then, um, so I'll do the analysis. I'll explain how do you go with that one. <coughs> Excuse me. So um, the first thing is you need to look at loadings that should be higher than 0 0.7 or 0 0.708. It, then it um, it comes to internal consistency or um, internal reliability, which you can get through composite reliability and Cronbach Alpha. Both the values should be higher than 0 0.7, but they should be lower than 0 0.95. And I'll explain later on why is it important that they are low, they should be lower than 0 0.95. And then now there's a recent measure which is called Rho A. Uh, it's also one type of alpha. Uh, you should also report this one because it's the new one. And the reason for that is because uh, uh, according to research, Kronbach Alpha is a very uh, conservative measure of reliability, which means it under reports the uh, results. Composite 
reliability is a lenient one or a more um, liberal measure of reliability, which means it's poor reports a little bit. Row A is somewhat in the middle, so it's also recommended to um, you know report row A, uh, and the value should be had in 0 0.7. Uh, once this is done, then you go to conversion validity. Uh, conversion validity basically means how much uh, the items are explaining the latent variable. So if your model is like this, where you are using these two questions to measure functional quality, you need to make sure that these two questions explain at least 50% of functional quality to make them uh, uh, reliable or valid. You know. So in this case, AVE should be higher than 0 0.5. Once this is done, then you go to next step, which is discriminant validity. Uh, now, traditionally for, I don't know, 25, 30 years, people have been using Fornell and Lacker, which is that the square of your AVE should be higher than the correlation of all the constructs, which we all see at the table. So uh, Fornell and Lacker is a criteria for discriminant validity, however, a uh, new research for PLS recommends to use HDMT, which is heterotrait monotrait criteria. Again, it's a very good paper by Hensler in 2015 that reports HDMT criteria. Now, this value should be higher than, um, uh, should be lower than 0 0.90, which was recommended earlier. But the more uh, recent one is that this value should be lower than 0 0.85 and I'll, again I'll explain why these values should be at whatever we say they should be at very soon when I'm going to analyze the data. So that's your reflective model assessment. Now if your variables are formative that's a separate story because formative variables are a little different. Uh, they are not like reflective. My suggestion to all of you is if you have formative constructs or if let's say even you don't have formative constructs, but you want to understand, uh, I would highly and highly recommend you to read this paper. This was published uh, a couple of years ago and um, in a special issue for International Journal of Contemporary Hospitality Management. Um, I was, uh, I'm very proud of this paper because I was guest editor for this special issue. Um, and this is again done by a, a bunch of people that I know very well. And um, I love all of them because they've done a lot of stuff for PLS and really good job. So this paper is about um, assessment of formatively measurement cons uh, measured constructs by Jackie Chua, Jackie Chia and Marco and then uh, Christian, but also Professor Ramaya that many people in Malaysia know and then Professor Hiram Ting. So uh, look at this paper, a very good paper to explain how do you um, assess formative models. Here, um, instead of taking loadings, AVE, Kronbach, Alpha, and all those things, because those are uh, specific to reflective uh, constructs, what you need to do is the first thing is you need to look at outer weights. Instead of loadings, you need to look at weights. And I'll tell you why this is happening like this. Uh, the second step is to look at collinearity among indicators. And this value should be uh, lower than 3.3. .3. Now, there are some references where it says that this value should be lower than uh, 10. Some people say it should be lower than 5. However, the recent standards say that this value should be lower than 3.3. .3. Once this is done, then you move on to check the significance of each of the item by doing a bootstrap to get the T value. Uh, and then um, now remember that if you are doing a reflective model, you look at the loadings. If the loadings are lower than 0 0.7, 0 0.6, 0 0.5, you delete them. With formative, that's not the case because formative constructs are like a hundred percent thing. So if you delete one item, then you cannot measure the variable with the rest of the item. So for formative uh, um, uh, constructs, all the items must be there in order to measure that construct. If you delete one item, then the definition of the construct changes. So it's not very easy to delete the items for um, uh, formative model. So what you need to do is uh, you need to think about um, should you retain or should you delete, right? So here is a simple rule of thumb. And the rule of thumb is this. If your indicators weight, which is same like loading, <clears throat> uh, is significant, then you have an empirical, like your, your data supports to keep the indicator. You don't delete it. 
if your indicator's weight is not significant, so you get the weight, but it's not significant, right? So then instead of deleting it, you go and check the loading for that weight, right? So what is the loading for that particular indicator? If the loading is higher than 0 0.5, then still you should retain that item. Because remember, uh, till the end, you need to make sure that you're not deleting it because if you delete it, your construct changes, right? And then the last one is if your outer weight is not significant, and your loading is also not significant and it's uh, you know lower than 0 0.5 then you don't have an empirical support to retain the indicator you cannot retain it empirically right so that's the rule of thumb a simple rule to understand whether you should keep or retain but again remember this is only for formative uh, constructs this is not for reflective only for formative then you go to the structural model assessment and structural model assessment, you have a few things that you need to do. Uh, or normally you see uh, the papers that people submit in a structural model, they talk about the path coefficients with beta values, like the coefficient for the path. <clears throat> and then people report T values and P values, right? T values, uh, P values are the significance values. And then they say whether the hypothesis are supported or not supported. However, it's recommended also to use confidence intervals, which I'll show you how you can do that, but confidence intervals in order to uh, say whether your hypothesis is supported or not. It's an additional um, analytical tool just to you know, support your hypothesis testing. Um, the second thing you need to report for your structural model assessment is R squared. R squared is basically the coefficient of um, uh, determination uh, which is the amount of variance in your dependent variable. Uh, you report R square. There's a question and the question is, is my R square good or bad? <coughs> There's no way for you to say your R square is good or bad, but it, it, it is relevant and it's relative to your field. Like in some fields, R square is higher. In some fields, R square is normally lower. So you, your R square should be consistent with the field that you are in. However, as a rule of thumb, um, R square values can be substantial. It can they can be moderate or weak, and these are the cutoff values. This is again a relative rule of thumb. So just look at that. And then um, the other thing is model fit. Now remember, many people ask about model fit because we are so used to MOS and CBSEM, which is highly uh, focused on model fit criterion or model fit um, uh, measures. That with PLS also people are asking, where's your model fit? Even reviewers are asking, like, why you don't use model fit? So is there a model fit in, P <clears throat> in PLS? Yes, there's certainly model fit and it's developing. The theory is developing for it. It's a new, new thing in PLS. However, uh, if you are using it, please make sure that you use it with caution. You should understand why this model fit exists and whether uh, you should really make strong conclusions based on model fit or not. So there are certain things that are available in PLS um, in order to uh, decide whether your model fits the empirical data or not. So what it means is simply that now if you are exploring now remember again going back to stage one that was um, your research purpose determination or your research goal determination pls is used in order to test several models in order to develop a theory so in this case if you have alternate models and you want to see which model fits well with the data that you have then you can and use model fit uh, criteria in order to compare the models, right? So one of them is SRMR, which should be lower than 0 0.08, right? So that's one thing. Uh, the second uh, measure that is available in PLS is NFI, which is non-fit index, uh, should be higher than 0 0.90, which is same like, uh, you know, CBSEM. Then there are a couple of other things, um, DULS, DG, um, these are some values, but you don't take the direct values. Uh, you should do this with confidence intervals. Again, the value shouldn't be more than the upper bound of 95% interval and 99% interval. I know it sounds complicated, but when we do the analysis, I'll show you how you do these things. And then the last one is RMS theta. Um, this is used only if all the constructs in your variable are reflective. This is still under development. There are simulations being run for this one. So at this time, um, I would recommend just to avoid 
using this B. Again, please make sure that when you use these developing things in PLS, uh, use them with caution, uh, talk to some experts before you use them, and certainly don't make stronger conclusions based on these numbers at this moment. So that uh, would be all for the PPT slides, right? So I, I just wanted to go through all this uh, at once. Uh, what I'll do is I will link uh, these slides uh, into the description of video on YouTube. So you can go to the description of the video on YouTube, maybe after a couple of hours. I'll link in the PPT slides and also some main literature uh, for PLS, right? So just look at that. Uh, this paper is pretty good. There's another paper that I have done. Um, I will show you that paper. Um, and again, I would recommend you looking at that paper because uh, of a cer uh, certain reasons. And I'll show you what those reasons are very quick. Just give me a minute. Let me quickly go here. So this is another paper that I did. Um, it's uh, assessment of PLS in hospitality research. Um, obviously, you can read the whole paper. It has a lot of discussion on certain things. But the best part about this paper, which I highly recommend everybody to uh, read, is the last table in this paper. In this paper, in this table, we provide guidelines for applying PLS SEM, even though I say in hospitality research because uh, we are reviewing hospitality uh, papers. But in this table, there are a lot of criteria with recommendations and rule of thumbs and references, right? So, for instance, um, uh, sample sites. So, people have a lot of things for sample sites. Some people say that. Uh, multiply the number of questions with 10 and that's good, blah, blah, blah. Uh, here we say that you should use power analysis and uh, references for it, right? So again, a lot of stuff um, when you are doing bootstrap, um, you know, how what's the number you should use and what is the reference for it? Then all, all the reporting guidelines and everything. So make sure that you uh, look at this table in some way, um, you know, Concise table that is going to help a lot of you. All right, so um, let me finish this one very quick. Uh, Sidan, is there any questions? Okay, maybe I can ask those uh, report related questions now. Okay. Okay, Laxman Pokrat is asking Is it necessary to report common method biases in PLS? If yes, how do we do it? Okay, so um, when it comes to common method bias, uh, it's not only for PLS, um, I mean, even if you are using simple regression in SPSS, common method bias has nothing to do with PLS. Common method bias has to do with how you are collecting data and what is the source of independent variables and dependent variables from the same source. Then there is a possibility that your data might have a bias because you are asking the same source for the causes and for the effects, right? So something like this. Um, anytime when you are collecting data from the same source, there is a possibility for a common method bias and you should try to deal with it. My recommendation is that instead of focusing on statistical tools to deal with common method bias, look into the literature that supports, um, you you know, uh, a priori or before data collection issues. So before you collect data, how you design your questionnaire, how do you write your questions? How do you collect data? Um, all those things can help you reduce common method bias. So look at things that go before data collection. If for some reason you didn't do that and you already collected data, then you should focus more on statistical remedies for um, you know, statistical uh, remedies for assessing common method bias. But again, it has, it's not specific to PLS. It is about anything, right? So um, anything that collects data from the same source, you should deal with common method bias. How do you do that? There are a couple of papers uh, by Professor Podaskov. There's another paper by, uh, I'm not, I, I don't know the full name, but um, you can um, certainly check it, Min et al, 2016, uh, about common method bias in hospitality research, which explains this one. I, I, I can actually try to find it now. Oh.
Uh, it's a very good paper, everybody who's interested in common method bias. So look at this one. Yeah, this one. So this paper, Common Method Advice and Hospitality Research, a critical review of literature and empirical study, I would recommend you to look into this paper. Uh, again, uh, there are multiple methods of dealing with it. Um, there's a table here that shows which methods. Here, so there are a lot of procedural remedies. These are the things that are before data collection, right? So you can collect IV and DV from different sources. <clears throat> There can be temporal separation, which means that you can collect data for IV at one time, for DV at another time. Uh, there can be psychological separation by making uh, different sections of the questionnaire or different pages of the questionnaire um, by providing uh, detailed recommendations for different sections in your questionnaire. So those are psychological separations. Methodological separation is where we use different type of scales for IVs and for DVs, um, so those type of things. Again, my recommendation is to look at this paper also, this for Kotsakov et al. 2003, and then they have another paper in 2012, the same authors. <clears throat> and then this current paper that I'm showing you. And then similarly, there are a lot of statistical controls, so Harman single factor, partial correlation, you know, uh, marker technique. So those are different ways on how you can deal with common method bias. All right. Uh, any other questions, Sidan? Yes, Mahmoud Bakir is asking, since the HTMT criterion has not been achieved, we give Cornell and Larkin's criterion, would this be a problem in reviewing process in publishing? You said if the former and Larkin is not available, should we use uh, HTMT? No, no, it, but opposite. Since the HTMT criterion has not been achieved, we give Fornell Lacker's criterion. Would this be a problem in reviewing process in publishing? Um, look, <laughs> um, so this is an interesting question. Now, I don't know because the, this is a one liner, so I don't know what exactly they're asking. So, if the question is like, if my HTMT is not achieved, which means if the HTMT does not establish discriminant validity, should I only go with Fornell and Lacker? And would that be okay? If that's the question, Yes, that's then, the actually. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> well, in my opinion, if your formula, in, if your HTMT is not established, then formal and Larker will also have problems. I mean, because these are two methods to establish discriminant validity, right? That the calculation methods are different, the, the logic is different, but they're establishing discriminant validity. And what discriminant validity simply means is that, um, okay, let me go back to. Okay, so uh, here are your variables, right? So let's say this ability is measured by x1, x2, x3. Motivation is measured by x4, x5. Opportunity is, x, um, you know, uh, measured by x6, x7, and x8. What we simply mean by discriminant validity is that this variable is measured by these three um, items, right? So the relation between these three items and this variable is higher than the relationship between this variable and this variable, right? So of course there's a relation between these two, which is a correlation, right? And then these three are measuring this. So um, another easy example for us to understand is, and again, this is a funny example, but I'll just say, um, so you said who asked this question, Sidan? Mahmoud Bakesh. Okay, Mahmoud. So let, uh, let me explain it like this. So basically, um, I have two kids and then I have neighbors as well, right? I have a good relation with my neighbors. Like I love them because they are my neighbors and then I also love my kids. But what discriminant validity says is that my relationship or my love for my kids must be higher than my love and my relationship with my neighbors. In that case, uh, this one is me, this one is my neighbor, and these are my kids. So my relation with my kids should be much stronger than my relationship with my neighbor, right? So that's that. Uh, this is discriminant validity, like this is what it says. Both Fornell and Larker and HTMT somewhat say the same thing, okay? 
Now, discriminant validity does not spy the, uh, specify the, uh, the formal and locker does not specify the high end of it, right? So what it simply says is that this correlation should be higher than this correlation. This is what it says. What HTMT says is that this the relation between these two. Uh, of course, the first um, the first criteria stays there, right? That the, the correlation between these items and this variable should be higher than the correlation between these two variables. That exists. What HTMT says is an additional thing, which is the relationship between these two shouldn't be higher than a certain point, which is 0 0.85. So the correlation between opportunity and motivation shouldn't be higher than 0 0.85. Because if it's higher than it, we already assume that there's very strong relationship, so pretty much like that. So coming back to the question, if your HTMT is not established, then it's pretty much that your formal and locker is also not established. So that's one thing. And another thing is that, most of the researchers, if one thing is not being established, then they go and find out ways how to go ahead and find some shortcuts to get things done. Uh, my suggestion is if it's not established, you should go and try to find the cause on why it's not established instead of finding another uh, additional thing to justify it, right? Because it's not going to work. So you need to go back and see your data. If it's not established, maybe that there is a problem with your data. Maybe your respondents didn't understand your questions, something like that. So please go back and find the underlying causes for why it's not being established, okay? All right, so um, let's go quickly and run one analysis in Smart PLS. Again, I assume that uh, you all have Smart PLS um, installed in your computer. So I'm just gonna use this. Um, um, default data set that is available in smart PLS uh, to run the analysis, right? So I assume that by, you know, and if you don't know how to run the, uh, like how to create a model like this in uh, smart PLS, I would suggest you to do this thing, okay? So I will uh, tell you what to do. Let me give me a minute. <coughs> so if you go to uh, my YouTube uh, channel, you will see that there is a video called uh, model assessment with smart PLS, right? It's a 20 minutes video. I would recommend you to watch that video first because that video is a basic one, which shows how do you open the smart PLS, where do you download it from and how do you run the analysis, a basic analysis. So it's gonna show you how do you create a model like this, right? So just watch that video if you don't know how to create this model and then you can watch this reporting standards because of time, I really need to. So, so the first step is go to calculate click on PLS algorithm and run calculation. Okay, so that's your first step. This is what you need to do. Now, in this case, if you look at your model, you have a few variables like quality, expectation, value, satisfaction, image, loyalty, and comp. I don't know what is comp, competition, I guess. Um, so that's, that's your model. Now, um, how do you run this model, right? So the first step I always tell to everybody is this. Here, it shows constructs, right? In this constructs, click on it and select AVE. So the first thing I suggest is to go and check AVE, right? Now what happens is these values and the variables, these these values inside are AVE values. So first you have a quick look, which values are lower than 0 0.5, which values are higher than 0 0.5. So at this moment, we have this value and this value lower than 0 0.5, right? So then we go to loadings and see which loadings you need to delete. Why I'm saying this is because when you delete one item, you are deleting a lot of data. So I normally recommend not to do that, you know, because Sometimes you don't have to delete an item. You have to check AVE. In this case, <clears throat> the AVE here is lower than 0 0.5, right? So let's see which one is the lowest item. So this one, which is 0 0.558, this is the lowest. So I'm gonna delete this one. At the same time, this is 0 0.485. So again, I'll see which one is the lowest one, which is e IMAG3. So these two, I'm gonna delete. Calculate PLS algorithm go back here and now 
if I look at AVE, all of them are higher than 0 0.5. So which means that <clears throat> my initial, just, you know, by looking at it, I feel it's pretty much okay. So I, what I do is, this is my, you know, report, okay? Now, because I need to copy paste a lot of stuff, so what I'll do is instead of taking things from here, I'll click on this export to Excel and I will export this somewhere on my desktop so that it's easier for me to, you know, use these uh, numbers for my reporting. <clears throat> So uh, now what I need to do is the, the remember the PPT, right? So this this one uh, now obviously when I look at this model, all of these are reflective. So I just need to go with the reflective one. This item loading is this this. So what I'm going to do is make this like that, and then this one like that. So the first thing I need is item loadings, right? So, uh, okay. 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 So the first thing is item loadings, right? So what I do is I go here to this um, smart PLS report that I had. Here it shows outer loadings, right? So I click on this show and it shows me outer loadings. Now, what I will do is, uh, obviously I'm not gonna do it for all the variables, but just a few of them. So customer um, exp uh, expectation, I take these two, post them here. Then I will take another one, which is customer satisfaction. And place them here. These two, I'm gonna. <clears throat> Where is it? Merge these two. I'm going to these. Okay, and copy. Okay, so what I'll do is I'll just uh, uh, tell you how do I report. Obviously, there are many ways of doing it. Um, I would suggest if you follow this one, this is the easiest and pretty much a standard. Uh, what I do is put here constructs, items, holdings. Then here I'm going to put AVE. Composite reliability, Cronbach Alpha, and Rho underscore A. Right. So, like I said, you have to uh, do this one: Composite reliability, Cronbach Alpha, Rho underscore A, and ABE. So, this table is gonna take all of these here. Right. So, uh, there are multiple ways of doing it. If you have too many words in your paper, I would not recommend putting your questions here. Right. The, the questions that are in your questionnaire, don't put them here. If you don't have a lot of words, then you can put your questions here. Now, what happens is that sometimes um, your questions are directly taken from other studies, right? So if you put your questions here and if your table is in your paper, right? Let's say if you are submitting your paper to elsewhere because elsewhere wants you to have tables in the paper, not as separate files, then remember that this is gonna be taken in turn it in. So if your questions are here, and if the editor checks the Turnitin on your paper, <clears throat> these will be considered as copy paste, right? Because Turnitin is a software. So it's gonna increase the percentage for your plagiarism. So, you know, just decide if you want to keep your questions here or if you want to provide them as an appendix, that's your choice. 
uh, but you can put your questions here or you can just put the coding for your questions here. This becomes your loading. Now, remember this one loading is lower than 0 0.7, right? So normally we say that loading should be higher than 0 0.7. Here it's lower than 0 0.7, but as far as your AVE value is higher than 0 0.5, then you can tolerate the loading lower than 0 0.7, but it shouldn't be lower than 0 0.5 or in some cases even 0 0.4 as far as your AVE is higher than 0 0.5. So in this case, we will not delete this item. We'll just keep it. So that's how you are going to take your loadings for all your variables. Um, I'm going to go back to this TLS one, uh, this report back to navigation. So once I have the loading is what I will do is here, I will find construct reliability and validity. So I click on this one and I'll see that this is construct reliability and validity. So <clears throat> for expectation, my Kronbach alpha is 0 0.23. Uh, my row A is 0 0.24 and my CR is 0 0.72, and this is 0 0.56. Okay, now um, if you think about it, um, my AVE value is okay. Um, oops. Okay, so my AVE value is okay. <clears throat> my composite uh, reliability is also okay. But my Kronbach alpha and my rho underscore A is not okay, which means there's certain problems with the reliability of this variable. Now, what are those problems? I'm not going to go into that because we are over time. But I'm going to do another video on how do you find the underlying causes for these type of values, right? So again, please make sure that uh, if these values are lower than the recommended, you need to go and check why these values are lower than uh, these values. Uh, why these values are lower than the cutoff value. So that's uh, for another time. Similarly, for customer satisfaction, um, I'll go here. Okay, so customer satisfaction is 0 0.81 for Kronbach Alpha, 0 0.81. And... Zero point seven two. So that's um, uh, how you do your first table, right? So you get all these values. Then the second one is your discriminant validity, right? So again, I'm going to go back to this Excel, to this navigation, and uh, now here, what I'll do is. All the way down here, I'll see discriminant validity. I click on show. So if you look at discriminant validity, it says Fornell and Larker. So this table is all I need. I go here, I paste it here. Now what you need to do is um, just bold these values, which you normally would see that these values are okay. So here, if what you need to do is you need to make sure that this value is higher than all the values here and like this. This value is higher than here and then these two, right? So here. Now, obviously, if you look at the 0.75, it's a little less than the 0 0.79. Uh, again, there are some issues with the model. Um, so, you know, I'll leave this for now, but this values these ones should be higher than the values below them. So that's your funnel and lighter. Then <clears throat> if we go a little bit down below, you will see that there is this HTMT. So uh, if I take this HTMT table, I paste it here, you will see that some of these values are higher than 0 0.85, right? So all those are in nine which means that here you have a serious problem with discriminant validity, right? So again, we'll have to look in. <clears throat> some of your variables are highly correlated with each other. So if let's say you look at um, expectation and image, 
it's highly correlated, right? Expectation and quality is highly correlated. Expectation and satisfaction is highly correlated. So it will give you an idea of, uh, you know, how um, the problems, why the problems are existing. The problems are existing because you have high correlation between different variables, which can also create uh, multicollinearity. So that's um, one issue. However, this is the way you go ahead with the flow, right? So you do table number one, then your table number two is your discriminant validity, which are these ones. So I'm going to go ahead and um, there is no formative one, so I'm going to leave it. But let's, let's say if we have formative one, I'll do it after structural model. So now I go to structural model and in structural model, what I do is um, I calculate go to bootstrap and then run a bootstrap. Okay, so for bootstrap, many people ask, what should this number be? Um, it starts with 500, default is 500, but keep it 5,000 or 10,000, which is good. It depends on how fast is your computer, but I'm just gonna go with um, this 5,000. Start calculation. Okay, so this is what I get, okay? And uh, now what I will do is um, I'll go to Excel, this first table right here, this first table, which can get from this path coefficients. So what I'll do is I'll go to Excel and paste it here. What I need to do is I, I um, don't need this second and third column. So I'll just replace it with these two them here. Now, if you look at these, these are your hypothesis, right? So usations for satisfaction and all this. <clears throat> so these are your values. I'm going to change this original sample to um, part coefficient. Uh, and then this t-test statistic remains same, p-value remains same. Uh, and then what I do is here, I'm going to put confidence intervals. I'll show you how do you get them. And then here you put your decision. So the first thing you need to do is um, uh, look at the uh, signs. So all these values are positive, which means all of the relations are positive. Then the second thing is look at the P values. So in this case, this one seems significant, significant. This seems like not significant. This seems like not significant. These two seems not significant. And then the rest of them are significant, right? So that's your first, um, um, you know, if you just look at it with your naked eye, it would give you an idea that these four are not significant. The next thing you need to do is get the confidence intervals. How do you get that? Um, so for confidence intervals, here you see confidence intervals, then here you see confidence intervals bias corrected, right? So this is your confidence interval. Now, in this situation, if you look at these values, you get these values from here. Uh, right. So let me... Excel format. I'll just go and paste this here. I actually need these two values, like this 2.5%, 97.5%. So I'm gonna go get these two values from here. I'll go and paste them right here. And you look at these two values. Um, okay. So what we need to see in this value is very simple. Um, you need to see um, if these two, so this is a 0 0.000, this is 0 0.330, uh, 0 0.250, 0 0.580. So what it simply means is this, if you have to draw these on a scale, let's say I go here, if you have to draw this on a scale, let's say like this, Let me remove this. 
All right, so if you have to draw these two on a scale, right? So what, what will happen is this. <clears throat> this is zero. This is plus side of the scale. This is plus minus side of the scale. So if you look at this zero, right? 0, 0.000, this one will fall here. And then this one is 0 0.330, right? So this one will fall somewhere here, 0 0.330, okay? So if you look at this value, it's showing you, uh, all right, it's showing you this area. So this zero on your scale doesn't fall in here, right? It's outside of this sequence, which means that this relationship is significant, okay? Similarly, if you look at this 0 0.250 and 0 0.580, again, if you look at this value, you will see that this 0 0.250 would fall somewhere here, 0 0.25. And then this one is 0 0.580, which will be here. So again, this section doesn't include this zero. So it means this relation is significant. Now, however, if we go to this one, this is minus 0 0.130. So this minus 0 0.130 is going to fall here. Minus 0 0.130 zero and the other one is 0 0.170 so 0 0.170 will sorry 0 0.170 will be here somewhere so again if you look at this section this zero belongs in this section right it's in the middle so that means this relation is not significant which is further strengthening <coughs> your results that you got from t value and p value so your decision here would be not significant. So that's how you get your confidence intervals and decide whether your relation is significant or not significant. So that one is your T value, P value confidence intervals. For R square, uh, if you go back to your this PLS results that we had earlier, you will see here is the value of R square. So I click on R square. The R square values for all my variables are here. So you need to see which R square is uh, substantial, which is moderate, and which is weak. So you get those values from here. And then for model fit, again, if you look at this PLS results that <clears throat> I had in Excel, you will see that here is one section called model fit. So if you click on model fit, you will see that here is your model fit value. So SRMR, like I said, it should be, there is Excel sheet. Yeah, so SRMR should be, uh, it should be lower than 0 0.08. However, here your SRMR value is higher than 0 0.08, which means your model is not fitting the data that you have. And you can already see that with your discriminant validity and your reliability numbers, right? So there's a problem with this model. And then the other one is NFI. Again, if you go and look at NFI, this is also lower than 0.9. So again, your model is not fitting the data that you have. Um, and then there's DULS and DG. So this one, you don't get the values. I mean, you obviously can get the values from here, but you don't need the values from here because for this, you need to check the confidence intervals. And your confidence intervals comes from bootstrap. So here we just run the bootstrap, right? So you can see the bootstrap. However, <coughs> if you look at the bootstrap results, you don't see the uh, model fit or anything here, right? So the reason is because when we run the bootstrap here, you will see that um, it selects basic bootstrapping. So in order to do model fit, you need to click on complete bootstrapping. So when you click on complete bootstrapping, you start calculation. Um, it's going to take a couple of minutes.
Okay, so once you do complete bootstrap, you will see that you now have the results for model as well. So I'm going to go to this DU. If you look at the PowerPoints, I said this DULS and DG shouldn't be more than the upper bounds of 95 and 99 <clears> percent. <throat> so right now I have this DULS. So if I click on DULS, these are the two values, right, that you have, and both of them are in red, 2.02, 7.13. Actually, these two values should be lower than both these values, 1.48. 1.70. This is the upper bound for 95%. This is the upper bound for 99%. So these 0.02 was like, let's say 1.40. It would be a good number because 1.40 is lower than this and this. Similarly, for this value, if it was, let's say, 2.72, that would be a good number because it would be lower than 2.84 and 3.60. Same is the case with D underscore G. So again, these, these two values should be uh, lower than these two values. So then your model fit establishes. But again, remember, it's a developing thing, so you cannot just go ahead and, you know, uh, without any reason, use these numbers. So I'm going to stop here because we are already way over time. I'll stop sharing because this is a basic analysis using your, um, you know, using your um, smart PLS. So, I'll go back to YouTube um, and then um, now we'll, we'll take like five, 10 minutes for questions. If there are any questions, um, we'll, we'll see how we can go with the questions now. All right, so done. So um, are there any questions? If there are any questions yes. you can ask me now. Yes, yes. Uh, <clears throat> Naima Adele is asking, what is the alternative for fitness of good when we report results in PLS? When we report what is the okay, so there's no alternate because, okay, so um, as far as I understand correctly, what is the alternative for model fit in PLS? Is that right? Correct. Okay, so uh, what happens with model fit is that, again, remember that in PLS, you don't have model fit very well established because one, it's an emerging field. Second, it's it's not the assumption of PLS. You are not confirming theories, you are exploring theories. So any model fit that you are using in PLS is actually to see the alternative models, like which model has a better uh, fit to your da data. So um, in PPT, like I explained, there's no alternate, but these are the uh, these are some of the measures, SLMR, NFI, there's DULS, DG, and RMS theta. So these are some of the values that um, you, know, you have for uh, model fit. Any okay. other questions? Yes, there are different, there are, there are several questions related to different areas to use PLS. I'm reading them back to back, okay? For mm -hmm. example, is it possible to use smart PLS for experiment analysis? Is there any advantage compared mm -hmm. to SPSS? Another question is, can we use it for impact evaluation? And another question is how to use PLS SEM in research of accounting and finance. And also the mm -hmm. other question is, is it applicable to use it for humanitarian and development project evaluations? Okay, so yes, uh, yes. For all these questions, there's a yes, okay. <laughs> <coughs> So one thing is that, again, like I said, go to the Smart PLS website. There's a lot and lots and lots of uh, reading on the Smart PLS uh, website in, in resources. Okay, so one thing is that um, if you look at this one, it will show you that um, obviously some of the stuff here is for, um, you know, methodology. So PLS predict, prediction-oriented model comparison, and then some videos are there. Uh, some algorithms like higher order models, goodness of fit, consistent PLS, blah, blah, blah. So if you are, um, if you are willing to do this, I would highly recommend you to, uh, you know, read these because these explain this stuff with some additional references and some additional stuff. So that's, that's one thing. The other thing is it also provides you some sample project examples. So you can, you know, like play around with data and stuff like this. So that's another one. Now um, in here, there's recommended readings. So those of you who ask for 
specific fields, right? So somebody asked if you can use a, a PLS in, let's say, education. If you want to do that, um, there is a paper recently done by another good friend of mine, uh, Majid Ghasimi. Um, it, it's about PLS SEM in higher education. You can look at that. Um, I've done PLS in hospitality. Then there are some other ones. So you can um, check into stuff like that. PLS and environmental things. Then somebody asked if PLS can be used for um, uh, for experimental data or experiments, right? So again, this is an open access paper, which is about data from experiments and PLS SEM. So you can look into this paper. Um, I saw that somebody asked a question about um, if they can use PLS with HR related research. So again, PLS and HRM. PLS and finance, somebody has accounting. I know that there are a couple of very good papers on PLS and accounting, so you can look into that. Um, and then I saw that somebody asked about neural networks and PLS, and I, I've seen a paper that is done on PLS, SEM, and neural networks. So just search for it on Google Scholar and you will find it, but you can certainly use PLS with these type of things. Okay, thank you. And there is another question. Uh, for example, one of the uh, audiences is asking Navil Atif. Uh, one professor suggested me to use Amos instead of PLS SEM for analysis in field of social and administrative pharmacy. I cannot understand why. Uh, um, okay, so again, it doesn't. Okay, so look, for everybody here, it doesn't matter what is your field. Your field doesn't matter. I mean, I know, I do hospitality research, right? So hospitality research is, but sometimes I don't have to use, uh, yeah, I recently did a paper with a, a student of mine, got just got published in IJHM. It's about hotel lobby designs. Uh, in that paper, we are simply looking at the comparison between two hotel lobby designs, but it's a very simple model. We are looking just at two variables and their impact. So instead of doing PLS, we are using ANOVA uh, or T-test, things like this, very simple. So sometimes you don't need to use a PLS. Uh, it depends on your research design, right? Or what do you want to achieve out of it? It has nothing to do with the field. So if you are doing a social pharmacy, let's say, social pharmacy, again, if your model is um, having multiple variables, you are looking at interplay between different variables, then yes, by all means, you can do SEM. Why you are professor is asking you to use MOS, I don't know. If your model is having non-normal data, if your sample size is small, if your variables um, are different, formative and reflective and things like this, if you are doing exploratory research, then do PLS. If you are confirming the theory, if your data is normal, if your sample size is big, uh, then you should use MOS. So it depends on what is your aim of your research, right? Then you decide whether you want to do PLS or CPSC. Okay, there is another question. Um, I also see that somebody else asked a question about um, using secondary data. Again, yes, you can, yes. Okay, uh, maybe you can answer that question and I will ask the next question. Yeah, so secondary data, again, I said earlier, as far as your data is quantitative in nature it's structured yes you can do it let's say if you are doing a study on um, uh, the predictors of organizational performance and your data is secondary right if you let's say looking at uh, organizational profitability or organizational retention rates or things like this which is a secondary data then yes why not you can use PLS so it depends on how you are measuring your variables and what's your research design okay uh, can you please tell the difference uh, about observed and latent variable? And moreover, what could be the right method for mediation? Is it right to just mention specific indirect path for mediation? Um, okay, so for those of you who are asking about mediation, again, because the time is so limited, I cannot uh, answer all the questions at this moment. I would recommend you to watch this video. I recently did this one on, uh, you know, last month, um, again, with a very good friend of mine, Professor Mustafa Rasul Imanish. Um, this is about mediation and moderation, but 
I, I certainly would recommend you to watching this video because this video, I have learned a lot of new stuff from Professor Mustafa. So it's on the YouTube channel available. It's about mediation and moderation. And that entire video is about questions related to mediation and moderation. So in that video, we discussed how do you hypothesize mediation and moderation? What is the best way of um, uh, creating a model with mediation and moderation? What is the best way of analyzing mediation and moderation? Stuff like this. So again, I would recommend you to really watch that video. It's going to you know, solve a lot of confusion about mediation and moderation in your mind. Um, okay, Sidan, one last question. Okay, one last question. Please, could you please tell the difference between common factor and composite factor? Okay, so common factor and composite factor, um, uh, this, in the simplest way, I'm going to explain a, a very simple thing, but again, uh, you know, readings are very important, so I would recommend you to read additional stuff. Common factor, what it means is that if you have items, let me go back to one model. That, okay, so if you, um, let me... Okay, Sidan, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Can you? Okay. Okay, so um, in this case, if we look at these models, right? So here, if we look at ability, ability is measured by X1, X2, X3. So in common factor, what it simply means is that uh, for this variable, for these three questions, there's a common factor that shares that common factor is ability, including some shared error as well, because these three uh, are explaining ability. These three, when you are measuring them, they also have some measurement error. So this factor is a common factor that shares some explanation from these three variables, plus also shares some error from them. That's why in MOS, when you are are doing modeling, you will see that the model looks like this, and then there is also one, come on, one E, and then, you know, there's like an error term that you create around your variable, right? So let me try to do it here. And like this. So you create an error term for each variable because it shows that there's a shared error. So that's common factor. The composite factor means that there are variables, and this again, it goes back to how do you uh, conceptualize variables. Composite uh, variables are where we say that this variable uh, is a composite of these three. So these three combine together to explain ability. So that's the basic conceptual difference between them. Um, so again, my suggestion is to read that editorial that we have written with examples and some um, additional details there. Okay. All right, then, um, so because uh, we are uh, already, I thought it will finish in one hour. It's already one hour and 40 minutes. So um, I think that um, I hope that people have learned something from it and it explains some stuff for, um, you know, uh, the, the, the people who are uh, on YouTube and Facebook who are watching. I don't know. I haven't looked at the questions on Facebook. And again, I want to say that when we do these type of webinars, if you can move to YouTube, that helps us track the questions better. Now, those of you who have questions and they did not get answers for your question, my suggestion is this, because time is limited, I really want to answer all your questions. So what I would suggest you to do is this. <clears throat> if you go to comments section, not the chat, I know you put your question in the chat, but I, I cannot answer your questions in the chat. So if you want answers for your question, my recommendation is this. Go to comments, put your question in the comment. So once you put your question in the comment today, tomorrow, day after tomorrow, whenever I have time, I'll go and answer your question. And I do this with most of my videos. Uh, you will see that even here, I'm going to show you. So there are questions. For instance, this one uh, says that uh, provide the name uh, to understand assessment of mediation and endogeneity. I answer this one. Um, similarly, here. So again, uh, if you are 
question is in the comment, it's easier for me to go and answer your question. So if you want answers for your questions, my recommendation is in, not in the chat, in the comments of the video, and I'll go and answer all your questions. Thank you, everybody, and I hope that you're all staying safe and you're all having a good day. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you.